Okay, good, <coughs> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is, uh, of course, the jazz panel, and um, I'm your host, but I have a wonderful team here. I'm about to introduce them. Just in case you wonder who I am, don't confuse me with Frank Sinatra. <laughs> One of my students at the conservatorium the other day said, you remind me of Frank Sinatra. I said, the old Frank Sinatra, the middle-aged Frank Sinatra, or the young Frank Sinatra. He said, the old Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I'm never going to ask that question again. So uh, welcome to the jazz panel. And um, the contact details are there. Um, I'm part-time lecturer <coughs> at the Conservatorium of Music and Jazz Studies, but my main gig is, is uh, in the Business School at QUT. Introducing our panel, to the far right is Lynette Irwin. Now, Lynette has had a tremendous amount of experience in the Brisbane jazz scene, and um, currently she's director of the International Jazz Festival, so we're all hoping to get a gig. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> Prior to that, going back to the 80s, she was uh, uh, 80s or 90s. You were 90s. our jazz 90s, our jazz coordinator, and um, uh, her role was to facilitate public interaction with this music we all love. In the middle is Tony Ashby, a veritable time traveller. Uh, I get a bit annoyed with him sometimes because when I start to talk to him, I don't want to stop. He knows so much. It's like walking around with Leonard Feather. He's very, very good. And he covers both styles of jazz, the traditional side and the mainstream side. To my right is Barry Ralph. Uh, this guy's been a jazz writer, a jazz broadcaster, what, 25, 27 years? Yes. He's written three wonderful books. They Passed This Way, which was published by a highly reputable publisher, Harper Collins, uh, about 19... 2000. 2000. Uh, in it was a, a, there was quite a bit of information about the swing era and the impact of the Americans here in World War II. Barry will talk to us about that. He's also written the, the other two books, The Crash of Little Eva and Savage Wilderness. Savage Wilderness is currently being negotiated as a film, so we may never get to see this guy as private. <laughs> <laughs> So that'll be good if they decide to do something with it. So our objectives today, this is not a formal lecture. What we're trying to do is have a discussion. We welcome any questions. And uh, we actually are limited to about 50 minutes. And we'll try during that time to uh, answer your questions. But also, you know, my contact details for Queensland Jazz Archive and I'd be happy to follow up any points that you feel weren't addressed in our short presentation today. So we'll be looking, uh, first of all, asking Tony for an overview on traditional and mainstream jazz. And of course, as a clarinetist who's played with all types of bands and uh, as a veteran on the Brisbane jazz scene, I think over 30 years now. 40. 40. <laughs> I'm trying to make you sound <coughs> young. No, young, uh, yes, yes. Okay, 40 years. He has tremendous stories. Of course, today it's too short a time. Mm. We may be running for um, State Library of Queensland a six week program called Journey into Jazz, where we'll take people through the history of the music, right from the field plantation, work songs, up to the contemporary styles of today. I've done this at QT, where I called a journey into jazz, and students actually come along and seem to like it. So we'll see what State Library might want to do there. We'll be talking about swing music, because many jazz devotees argue that this never was jazz so popular as it was in the swing era. Uh, I think that can be challenged now, when jazz went electric and got into funk, uh, and bridged jazz with certain rock elements, it, it drew a new mass audience. Uh, but there's no doubt that the swing era was a, a, a major trend and I think we can all look back to it with a great deal of affection. Is there an Australian jazz style? The panel didn't know I was going to ask this, but people like Bruce Johnson, who ran a public seminar here on this, wrote about this uh, 1982 in Jazz, a Contemporary Music magazine, and we had quite a good debate uh, about that. Um, 
if our secretary for QGA is about to leave for Brazil, Peter Freeman, uh, if in the next two or three weeks you've got inquiries about QJA, uh, just email me. In Peter's absence, I'll be wearing his hat as well as my own hat. And uh, if you go to our website, you'll see that we've identified about 40 or 50 Tony Brisbane jazz musicians about whom we're collecting data at the moment. Yes. Our partner in this is the State Library of Queensland. Uh, one of our valued co-workers right in the back is Robin, Robin Hamilton. Uh, Laurel Dingle, the music librarian, is also part of our team. And we've got to get serious about this. We've lost too many wonderful musicians who had a lot to tell us about those earlier times. And uh, I was very lucky that in my role as jazz writer for the Courier Mail, Jazz, the Australian Contemporary Magazine, and occasionally the Sydney Morning Herald and the Australian, I was able to interview wonderful musicians. Um, Tony, Rick Price, Marlon Hayes, I could give you a list of 40. So we've got some documentation in the Courier Mail database where those stories are still on file, but equally we need to do more. Now we'll begin with our panel discussion, but please interrupt me or the group any time. Tony, I'll start with you. Now right. I've been told by the sound engineer I need to sit down over here. Okay. Uh, Tony, starting, Tony, starting with you, this will be edited later, starting with you, um, when did you first get involved with this music? Well, I was at boarding school in England and I was 12 when someone lowered the um, head of a wind-up gramophone onto the edge of it and out came Louis Armstrong's Alligator Blues it's an old 78, and I was hooked on it immediately, and I still am. So I was 12. Mm. And very soon I got on to Bix by to Beck, Bessie Smith, and I started reading whatever I could. I was blessed with having um, ill health, so I couldn't go out and play football or cricket, or all those accident-prone activities. So I would just have a good old asthma attack and sit down and read books on jazz and listen to it on the 78 cool. player. <laughs> so I guess jazz won. I wouldn't have made a good All Black anyway. <laughs> were, you, were you able to see the Armstrong Band when it toured Australia in the 50s? Uh, no, I saw it in Auckland, um, I think in the 60s actually. Hmm. Did you see it, Barry, the Louis Armstrong Band? No, he, the last tour he came out was 64, I think, That'd the last right. tour. Mm. Yep. And um, he was the one that I really disappointed I never saw before, Louis, because uh, he was the original icon. But 64 was his last... Uh, appearance here in Brisbane and I just wasn't old enough to go see him. Yes. Uh, was, did anyone else in the audience see Louis Armstrong back in those early times? He was... Um, oh. Did you? Did you see Louis? What was... Tell us in a sentence or two how that felt. What did you connect with Louis? Well, I've been listening to his records for several years and he performed at the Festival Hall in London. Mm. I just saw him the one time. It was just the one visit to, to London. And mm. I remember he had a uh, singer with him, Velma Middleton. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to remember the other person. I've, I've got it all written down somewhere. And what year was that that you saw, Liz? Sorry? What year was that? When you saw the, what year was it? Oh, that would have been in the 50s. Yep. Mm. Wow. in the 50s. Mm. If you can find your notes and would allow us, QGAA, to copy them, that could be part of our musical memory. Yeah, I and don't think my... I've got scrapbooks of jazz, but I don't think they go back that far. I didn't start collecting until I arrived in Brisbane. Mm. Uh, so probably the scrapbooks go back... Yes. ...to the 80s, thereabouts, I suppose. Just one word about Lewis's gig here in '56. It was just like a rock star. We had a look mm. at the original Corey Mal, and that, that, I think he did about three shows here. And then he went down to this hotel and started practicing his horn and three or four hundred people outside the hotel. That's wow. amazing. He was the first great innovator and the last great entertainer, I think, in jazz. Yeah. Because he made jazz fun. He, he was a, a great medium to bring people into jazz, you know? 
And I, and I think the entire band ended up uh, on that occasion going around to one of your colleagues' house, Sid <laughs> Romney. <laughs> so we had, yes. oh, we had the bassist Arvel Shaw, pianist Billy Kyle, trummer young trombonist. Lewis didn't go around, but as Sid, Sid explained to me, they were all sitting on the floor drinking Aussie beer. Hmm. And uh, Sid went backstage after the show, and Lewis was sitting in his dressing room with a big towel wrapped around him. And Sid waved to him and said, OK, to come in. And Pops yelled, uh, Armstrong yelled, hey, Pops, yeah, come in. <laughs> That's the kind of extrovert he was. He was a very interesting guy. Tony, getting back to you, um, when you first arrived in Brisbane, let's time travel on this. Okay. Um, what, what were the, the main jazz styles that you can recall? Well, the main job was trying to find jazz in Brisbane at that time. And I'm now looking at, shall we say, 1968, uh, no, 19, 1969, and soon after I arrived, I had a look around. I made contact with Sid Bromley and Titch Bray, who I knew by reputation from his records, and six months later, a friend of mine from New Zealand, Bruce Haley, very good, I was actually born in Tasmania, a very good trumpet player, and he and I had a band in Auckland for many years. So we were used to um, playing Dixieland together. And when he arrived, I said, look, Bruce, there's not much jazz here. And I noticed an advertisement in the Courier Mail about some Saturday afternoon jazz at the Combsley Hotel. So we went out there and had a look. And in retrospect, they were some of the best professional musicians in Brisbane at the time. There were the Thompson brothers, Alan Cooley, Vic Ceriso, I think, uh, I'm not too sure who the drummer was, or the bass player, Eric Wynn, I think, was on bass, and I um, can't remember the drummer. And, yeah, they were great musicians, and playing a sort of off-the-cuff, Dixieland-come-mainstream jazz. Mm. And we mentioned that we were from over from New Zealand, musicians, and were there any blows, and could we sit in? And, of course, they said no. So uh, we thought, oh, we like this hospitality <laughs> they have here. So um, Bruce, talking to Bruce later, he said, look, never mind, Tone, we'll do what we did in Auckland. We'll start a scene, and soon they'll be on the outside looking in. And that's exactly what happened, because we formed a band. We met up with Bill Atkinson at the Adventurers Club, mm. and when they opened up their pre the present location, the Brisbane Jazz Club, we took the band in, and we ended up playing Thursday nights and Sunday nights. And at that time, it was the only place in Brisbane open on a Sunday night. So the overriding style for that period would have been traditional jazz. Well, was there any I would, mainstream I would jazz? Say, or? I would say Dixieland mainstream. Mm. We, yeah, did, we didn't common, use... Uh, yes. I mean, in terms of jazz, the Eddie Condon type of jazz, it wasn't yeah. a banjo-oriented no, band yeah. at well, all. No, traditional Dixie But I had the tenor sax, so yes. we'd do a few jump numbers or mainstream numbers. Right. And funnily enough, over the years, all the musicians from that other band that wouldn't let us in came into the club and we let mm -hmm. them sit in with us. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting, while this is going on too, we're still seeing major overseas artists. I think Dave Brubeck came, comes here about 1960, 61, to Festival Hall. There are other influences coming to Brisbane, and I think perhaps seeding the ground for some future changes. And uh, I don't know whether you saw Brubeck no, in that first him. visit. But uh, Tony goes on, because of his tremendous interest and love for the music, to become a founding member of the Brisbane Jazz Club, and actually you were its first president. No, Bruce you was went? the first president. I was what I called myself the organiser. The organiser. <laughs> the organiser there, yes. Um, because, you know, what we did at the time was all terribly illegal. I mean, luckily, laws were not quite so demanding. We ended up breaking every law in the Licensing Commission Act, and we got... <laughs> Bruce and I had to go into the commission, we got busted, and we had to go for a period where we weren't allowed to sell grog. Then we had noise abatement notices uh, from the old uh, workers' cottages opposite the club, which were... And I remember Bill Atkinson, being entrepreneurial, started a property trust where he bought a couple of those houses and um, we subscribed to the trust and the idea was he rented the building, the houses out to members of the Adventurers Club at a fairly meagre sort of rent on condition they didn't complain about the noise. Fantastic. Mm. So um, <laughs> it was a very good way of overcoming a problem 
Um, yeah, so that's what we were doing in those days. Well, moving ahead to the 70s and 80s, did you see changes in the music, the, the variety of the jazz music being played? Well, I can only talk from personal experience because I was, had a full-time job and my main activity was playing down at the jazz club at the time. Mm. The first um, departure was, well, for me personally, I joined the... Uh, the CMF band, that's the Army Reserve Band, because I wanted to get some practice at sight reading and playing in a big band, concert band, which I enjoyed. And along the way, we ended up playing some of the Glenn Miller charts when we were doing little concerts with yes. the Army band. And I thought, I didn't know these arrangements still existed. And I found that one of the sax players in the band had a quite a good library, Rod Taylor. So um, I had a chat to Rod, and over a period of months, I mapped out a list of people, musicians, who I knew could read. And I said, look, let's, I'll start a big band. We'll play down at the jazz club on a Thursday. Probably no pay. Do you want to come along? And those guys, for about, while I was running it, which was about two and a half years, used to turn up the last two Mondays of each month. We were put on a concert. We called it a jazz and swing concert down at the club. Mm -hmm. And we just played swing music because... Quite frankly, that was the big band music I liked. I, mm. I very much loved the Artie Shaw, Benny Goodman, Duke Ellington big band. Mm. And from my point of view, it's just like going over to one of those 78s and putting on a Tommy Dorsey record and uh, instead the guys were there in front. Mm. So I did that for two until the end of 1976. I gave a lot of things away at that time, including the big band. It culminated in, for me, what was a a very highlight of my life where the big band played at a concert at the 1976 jazz convention at the, the, the university and we had both of the convention stars Bob Bernard and the American pianist who worked with Louis Armstrong they did a sit, set with the band at which we recorded and I thought you can't do better than that mm -hmm. and once you try to compete with yourself that's the time to leave it. Are there any audience members who, who were active in the Brisbane jazz scene back in the 70s? I remember that gig you were talking about. Oh, yes. <laughs> Tom Baker wandering through it. He visited. Yes, he had a band up for the convention yeah, yes. too. They played at the um, <coughs> main hall concert. Yeah. Very, very good. All dressed in white. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I'm really sorry to interrupt. Um, we're recording this session. And the only way that we can capture comments like yours that are really special, um, we need you to speak into the microphone, so okay. would you mind, did you want to have that? It wasn't worth speaking. Really? Oh, it was a gem of information, we can exactly. edit in. Yeah, yeah. it's lovely. Let, let's hear it. I don't it. mean to make a fuss, it's just a practicality. Yeah, would you be better off sitting down the front with us too so we can see what's sure. happening? Okay. I remember the gig which you mentioned, Tony. It was tremendous. It was wonderful at that, that con convention. And also, the Tom Baker band was a very, very popular mm, group good there. Band. It was a great convention, which you did most of the organising for, I remember. Oh, yeah. Milam and I sort of co-hosted it, and I was the secretary oh, nice. treasurer. Mm. Yes. When you're speaking to the mic, if you want to give your name, just... Oh, hi, Barbara. Um, Barbara Price. Um, then address the panel. We've got an idea then that you're an audience member. They might be playing this 20 years down the track. Oh, good. Well, none of us are being here yet. No, but for the sake of context, it might be good if the audience member said, uh, audience member Barbara Price, and then find the question. Uh, let's, let's move ahead to the 80s, because I suspect by then there are changes um, in the music scene. I was around Brisbane myself at that time and I was hanging out in some of the same venues as you. And, um, but I detected then that there were signs of more contemporary jazz appearing on the horizon. Uh, but what did you see? Okay, well, uh, I reckon the best years for, tradition to, for, for traditional jazz in Brisbane as far as I can see while I was here was between 1975 and 1985-86 and you've got to remember everything that I said before I had a day job at that time mm. at the end of 1988 in spite of what people said I did give up my day job 
and I became what I describe myself as a full-time professional out-of-work jazz musician mm. and have been ever since. Mm. Now, when one does it full-time, one has to go after more gigs than what one would normally do if one were doing it on a hobby basis. So I started playing different types of jazz at that time. I remember the Queensland Jazz um, Action Society, I think it was, started yeah, off jazz. Yes. Round, round about that time. Yes. Um, in fact, <coughs> I did a couple of sets with uh, Barbara's late husband, Rick Price, mm. there. And uh, although it was mainly slanted towards the modern mainstream type yes. of jazz, they certainly allowed other styles in, which I thought was great for Brisbane at that time. Yes. Um, getting back into, uh, what are we looking at, um, 85? 85 onwards. 85 yeah. onwards, okay. Round about um, in that period, there was some great music around. There was some great um, imports. Hans Kasemeyer, a wonderful pianist mm. from Melbourne, came up here to live. Alan Leake, a very entrepreneurial drummer who ran a jazz club in Melbourne called Storyville mm. and organised Australia-wide tours and overseas, was, made the Gold Coast his um, centre of operations, a great reed player called Lockie Thompson, who I remember hearing at the 19th Jazz Convention in Newcastle many, many years ago. Mm. So there was an influx of musicians, plus two of the most important, they're the two guys who still play with the band when it gets together, and I'm referring to the vintage jazz and blues band, referring to Andy Jenner, the clarinetist, and John mm. Braven, the trumpeters, mm. excellent musicians in their particular style. They've been living in Brisbane ever since and have contributed an immense amount to Brisbane uh, jazz over the years. Mm. Um, towards the end of that period, I noticed that um, Oh yes, while well, we're still on the plus, a guy called Joe Webster came over from New Zealand, who was uh, quite a guy, I must say, a very good entertainer and entrepreneur. He resurrected jazz at the Story Bridge Hotel, which for many years had been the centre yes. of jazz, going back into the 50s, I think. So he started off there. I played with his band towards the end of his stay. And Joe, too, got bitten by the big band bug and formed a band called Swing Fever Big Band. Mm. And I was a foundation member of that. But uh, towards the end of that decade, we noticed that the... Whereas before, if we did a Dixie gig, it would be a seven-piece band, it started to drop to a four-piece band. Given a few more years, it would be a three-piece band, mm. then a duo, and the bulk of the work that I do now, which is purely by choice, is um, I do solo work, mm. and that's the way I've chosen for me to go. So is this because the other musical styles were um, developing their own audiences and traditional jazz wasn't quite the, the pinnacle that it once was? I don't mean musically, but in terms of younger audiences, they were looking for something else? Yes, you're quite right. And I also maintain one of the problems of the lack of, shall we say, traditional uh, um, jazz in Brisbane is not so much the lack of venues, but the lack of musicians there mm. to play it. I mean, yeah. if you want to create something for the public, you must have supply. And as there was no supply, and there hasn't be, ever been a lot of supply in Brisbane, except for that 75, 85 period, if there's no supply, you, you, you can't get a demand. Yes. Now, while that period was is going on, of course, we can see the rise of younger musicians coming in, like the musicians playing in this building today, and that's great. Yes. There's another question I was going to ask you about jazz changes as you see them today, but I'll ask each panel member that as our coda, as we conclude our program. Um, but we were certain, from my experience in the 80s, seeing people like Rick Price playing. He had a bent horn, Dizzy Gillespie style, didn't he? Yes. And he was playing bebop, night in Tunisia. Wherever he could. Oh, yes. yeah. mm -hmm. And I wrote a couple of stories about him. But at the same time, I could go and hear Tony. Mm. And then in the 80s, which we're about to hear the Glenn Miller Band arrives from the United States which actually comprised half Australian, half Americans. Barry, turning to you and this wonderful thing that you call swing, tell us what you mean by that. Well, as you're saying, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, <laughs> Duke Ellington. But my introduction to uh, jazz and swing music came through a, a Glenn Miller 
record. I'm, mm. I'm pretty sure that'd be a common thing for a lot of people. You hear the in the murder and all that sort of thing. And I like what I've heard. And this was in the um, late 60s, early 70s. And uh, the reality of those days, it wasn't just uh, do you like the Beatles, but what, what is your favourite Beatles sort of thing. So I was a bit of an oddity. And I started to get into music that happened in the 30s and 40s. So, mm. But it was just something melodically, harmonically, and arithmetically more substantial than, than what was going on in the popular scene then. Mm -hmm. And I continued to uh, buy records. And, uh, and then I studied clarinet for a few years. I, I never played it professionally, but it did give me the opportunity to have some empathy for, mm. for musicians. And the quality of the and, and a little rudimentary... Um, knowledge of music and then I started to I met Sid Bromley who oh, we all yeah, know yeah. the late Sid Bromley who was it's hard to describe him Tony but if you know <laughs> what I know something about jazz <laughs> see Sid Bromley very, very he, knowledgeable yeah very knowledgeable. he goes way back and uh, the late Sid Bromley and he I could listen to some of his records he gave you books to read etc mm. and then um, I started to uh, work with a guy who was uh, a very big swing fan and uh, records for sort of change hands etc but in the early 70s, I thought there was a very healthy scene here in, a, in Brisbane. Tony's talking about the Adventurers Club and uh, yeah, Pacific Jazzmen, was that? That's right, that was that, the house mm. band, yes. But what really excited me was the big band you had on there every Thursday night. Oh, yes. Full of first-rate musicians. Yep. And who were playing the, the charts live that I was listening to on the records. And let's face it, regrettably, the swing year and the great classic jazz, most of it was recorded in low fidelity, wasn't it? Yep, yeah, that's right often wish we'd had, if the big bands were around in today's recording technology, they'd be sensational. But today's rock and pop music wouldn't succeed in low fidelity. Yeah, but, but it's interesting how that tradition persists. I, I've just got back to San Francisco and I was driving around with two American, I used to live there, I'm an Aussie, but I lived in San Francisco for quite a long time. Went back for my fifth trip just three weeks, four weeks ago, and there was a, a jazz station. I text Barry straight away, I knew he just about excite himself the bits uh, on the radio i found a swing station that's all that, mm. that, that was the only music it would play in the bay area in san francisco it was just dedicated to playing this music mm. you were it, describing if i'd worked harder i could probably found a traditional jazz yes. station yes. when you're in a city like san francisco which is really no bigger than brisbane you're surrounded by five and a half six million people all in that bay area you can have niche markets for this audience getting back to Let's say the 30s and Benny Goodman, that wonderful Carnegie Hall concert. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see that as a focal point, that a big band could go to Carnegie Hall? The Carnegie Hall performance was a seminal event in jazz. It was the first time in a formal concert hall they played jazz music. And it was actually recorded by one overhead mic. And 12 years later, in 1950, Goodman found them in his attic or his garage or whatever. He played one or two of them, realised that he was onto something, took them to Columbia. They put them on tape, and the double album, Benny Goodman at Carnegie Hall, has never been out of print. Mm, no. And even to this day, Tony, that has an energy and a vitality that performs yep. that. Well, I play, uh, as part of my jazz history class, we have two, two classes. One is early jazz up to bebop, early bebop, and the next one is bebop and beyond up to electric jazz. But in my first class, which is running this semester, we do Sing, 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 and the students really like it. It's a, it's Cooper on drums, the power behind it. Uh, it's still there and it can link to an audience of 20 year olds almost a century later. Well that performance, uh, the record, it, the sound quality is acceptable but no more. So you can mm. imagine what it was like if we could have recorded properly. <laughs> but what was happening in those days, the 30s and 40s, was the only time in jazz history that they had the mainstream audience. Yes. Popular music was good and yeah. good music was popular. Yeah. You had, you know, 60% of all records sold were jazz influenced popular music. Right? Yes. You were lucky that, uh, and so was I, that when the Glenn Miller Band came out here, we met some of the musicians. Yeah. Um, people like uh, Billy May, who arranged for Sinatra, but also yep. had his own history as a trumpet player, and Zeke Zassi, John Best, uh, great ambassadors for their country. But it was a hybrid band uh, comprising eight or nine core veterans from the Miller era. Yeah, and the rest of the locals, yeah. How, would, how was that band musically? Uh, well, 
it's very difficult to evaluate how good it was musically. Basically, it was a holiday for the guys. I don't even know if they rehearsed, but it didn't matter. We were just in their company, mm. listening to them play, mm. talking to them, you know. But I don't think they came out here to make a musical statement. There was a nostalgia thing. Yeah, well, it pulled the audiences because every time I went to see them two or three times, and it was a full house. Yeah. Um, 1,900 people. You know, all those guys, are, all those guys are gone now, regrettably. In fact, the swing era, there's very few, if any, musicians still, still playing who are in the swing era. Yeah. Talk about the Glenn Miller Band. The original Glenn Miller Band is only two alive. Yes. And so, unfortunately, that sort of attrition is, is ob obvious in jazz, but uh, they did record prolifically. Mm. And if you want to listen to the uh, early big band jazz eras or whatever, there's plenty of music there should you want to sort it out. Getting back to your excellent book, They Pass This Way, you do discuss the impact of the Americans in World War II, and this was a time when we had over a million US servicemen and women passing through our country. Australia was a big leap-off point to attack the Japanese in the Pacific. The Artie Shaw Band actually performed in Brisbane in September 1943, and even in my hometown of Rockhampton, <laughs> they played in the main street next to Thomas Brown's warehouse, and to this day, people can tell you about <coughs> hundreds of Rockhamptonites jiving on the streets. You thought they were all square up there. <laughs> they were jiving. I don't, wouldn't say they were quite jitterbugging, but they were jiving to this band of US Navy personnel playing off the back of a truck. And I can't walk past that vacant allotment without imagining what it must have been like. Mm. What was your assessment of the impact of the, well, the musical impact? If you've got to look at Australia during the war. It was an isolated and insulated country, right? There was virtually no media. Its only window to the outside world was the cinema. Mm. That's all they had. And, of course, the Americans came down here, over here, over sex and overpaid, whatever the term was. But they did, did bring their culture <laughs> down here, and as a result, you know, it did have an impact. But musically speaking, the arrival of the Artie Shaw Navy Band in September 1943, it played on all the capital cities, ostensibly for American servicemen. There's plenty of Aussies snuck in and whatnot. And, but that was a great band. And there's, I can remember talking to somebody who was at one of the concerts, and there was a 20-minute version of One O'Clock Jump. Oh, yeah. gee. Yeah. That would have been good. And um, nobody touched a note of music. Mm. But what... what um, before then, the jazz musicians, jazz collectors, only had this music via the 78 RPM. Yes. Uh, yes. And, yeah. But to hear the band live yes. was overwhelming. Yes. And of course, one of the things that Tony, they, uh, they mentioned was the sheer volume, how loud they played. And of course, after that, everybody was playing loud. Mm. But Shaw himself was fairly indifferent to that. He, did, he didn't come down here to do anything uh, to influence or encourage any local musicians, but the band was certainly the first major musical outfit that came to Australia, albeit not for commercial purposes. And Mike Sutcliffe, in writing in the Jazz, the Australian Contemporary magazine, uh, paints a picture of the, um, of the impact of that band. It certainly drew other musicians, Australian musicians, like a magnet. And people, yeah. trouble was you couldn't get in because priority went to American service men and women, or good looking Aussie girls. <laughs> and if you were a guy, it was gender prejudice in reverse. You couldn't get in there. A 14-year-old <laughs> year Don Burroughs heard the band. And if you see Don, you ask him what he thought of that band. It was just yes. tremendous. But that was during the war. But after the war, of course, Lee Gordon and various other uh, entrepreneurs brought jazz acts down. So it wasn't quite as uh, barren as it was due before the war. Mm. But um, certainly the Artie Shaw Navy Band, very significant event. In the music, history. musically, a oh, absolutely, event. and in terms of entertainment, yeah. Well, in those days, most swing bands entertained as well as played great music. That was yes. probably the attraction of them all, I guess. Did you see the Artie Shaw Gramercy Five when it toured 15, 20 years after the war ended? Of the Artie Shaw's last tour, I think, was Australia. He came out here with Buddy Rich and Ella Fitzgerald. Mm. That's right, yes. He wasn't impressed with the local bands they got together, and he said that that was the last time he played music. He, when he went back to the States, he never played clarinet again. Oh, my God. Yeah. But, of course, he wanted to write books. And he should still play the clarinet. You know, he had yeah. God-given talent. Unfortunately, mm. he didn't. He stopped playing. Over your 20 years as a jazz broadcaster, and interestingly, Barry, had a couple of the Glenn Miller guys on his program, didn't you? When yeah, we had Billy John, May. Billy, Billy May. May. 
They were nice guys. They just enjoy talking about music, yes. you know, and they keep it intelligent and interesting. And you know, there's very little they won't do for you. Yeah, I was there. I think for one yeah, of those. Yeah, you sessions. were. Was, I remember that. And, and uh, I started to write for for the Gold Coast Bulletin, became their jazz writer for 15 years, and then started to do commercial community radio with the jazz program. So I had the opportunity to interview and talk and associate with a lot of great jazz musicians, not only mm. here but overseas as well. I think one thing I remember, and Barry probably does too, is we were talking to trumpeter John Best, who described to us quite graphically what it was like for him to drive black American singer Billy Holiday through the South in 1942. This is a time when racial segregation in the US was very dominant, and uh, the band would go in the front door, but Billy would have to go into the kitchen, but sometimes wouldn't be allowed to stay in the same hotel. And uh, I can't describe it as movingly as graphically as he did, but you could get these kinds of stories. Or Billy May telling you how he managed Sinatra after Frank wanted to do a 17th cut, and they'd already done 16 <laughs> cuts, and Frank was such a perfectionist, perfectionist. and we, we got the solution to that, didn't we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but we, can't, we haven't got time to go down that road. Any questions to this swing genius, Barry? Oh, yeah. Stop, Neville. It's, it's, I just, we've, I got, just, we've got 30 people here. Yeah, I just enjoy the music. And frankly, uh, people talk about the swing here. I think swing's still around, I mean, yeah. to some extent. Michael Bublé, etc. And a lot of pop singers even today love singing with a big band. It's just that it's not in the fore, forefront of popular music. Anymore. Well, let me just correct you on that, because next month at the concert hall, and I suspect 1,900 people will be there, is a swing evening. Big band, singers. Um, we had the Count Basie band here last year. I was at that performance. 1,900 people, standing ovation. Um, oh, there's that radio station in California. You know, it, it's still out there, it's but it's not you in your face. There. No, if you want to look for it, it's there, and the, the rewards are many. But the fact that they had a house full sign for the Count Basie band, and I think two weeks mm. later the Miller band was out here. Yes. This is the official Miller band. None of the original musicians were in the band. No. They played Miller's charts, and they worked 52 weeks of the year. So it's there, yeah. but um, you've really got to be curious enough to to uh, to seek it out. Yeah. Bublé will be here in 2014. I'm not his press agent, but it'll be at the Boondall Concert Hall, and I'll bet you there'll be six or seven thousand people there. I'm more big on Sinatra than Bublé, and Bublé, in some ways, is more big on Sinatra than Bublé. He's actually on record as saying, "I'll never try to sing like Sinatra. I couldn't." And I think that shows a bit of humility, but he'll be there. And we don't forget this gig next month at QPAC. So we want to go along to see yeah, that. Yeah, sounds good. Um, we'll save your comment about contemporary jazz uh, or, or where we all see the music heading today. Any questions to Barry? He's a true time traveller. <laughs> Tell us your name, audience member. Hi, um, hi I'm Catherine. Um, I, my parent, my grandparents had a dance band that was based out of Gumeri and they used to pull a crowd on the coast of about a thousand people. This is sec you know, the Second World War, but they seemed to do it with just my mum and uncle and aunt and yeah, they used to tell me lots of stories like that. So I grew up listening to ragtime with my grandmother yeah. and Fantastic. but the thing that I never... When people play music, you just accept yeah. that's the way it is. I was reading something about, I'm not sure, apart from the sheet music and possibly with records, how did the music come over from New Orleans to here? What were the connections did? Was it just sheet music? Oh, it was performance, I can answer wasn't that well, to extent. Well, <coughs> Go on, Barry. If, if you look at New Orleans being the, the birthplace of jazz, that's fair enough, arguable, but it's fair enough. But basically, it was, it was a progression. The early jazz artists didn't read music at all. It was only into the uh, early 1920s that they actually started to record. But in the 20s and 30s, through people like Paul Whiteman, Ison Jones, and Gene Goldkett, etc., they started to have bands that did do arrangements, and then there was the solos as well. But the swing era, the big band era, Certainly they were playing printed arrangements and also the solos were uh, totally up to yourself, totally ad-lib, etc. And that's what I think makes the music great because um, in those days too you had a 78 RPM medium, the, the, the old 78, and the running time was like 3 minutes, 3.10, 3.20. So brevity became a virtue. 
So had all these wonderful performances condensed into a uh, three-minute uh, art form, and that's why I think it sounds great today. You don't have these 5, 10, 15, 20 kind of things. But there's some interesting um, backdrop to that too, and it's an excellent question. Uh, during the gold rushes in Australia in the 19th century, a lot of Americans came to Australia to find the big clunk they couldn't get back home. They wanted entertainment, just as they did when they heard in World War II. Black minstrels came to this country. Not only were they vaudevillian, but they were a mixture of styles and musical <coughs> projections. And Andrew Bissett, an Australian researcher, has written in his book, Black Roots, White Flowers, that Sydney may have heard the blues before Chicago. This is an interesting contradictory <laughs> argument. And uh, so we, we've got to do a lot more research in some of these things, but uh, I, I find that very intriguing that yep. <laughs> Sydney may have heard the blues. And I can give you the reference too. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a very interesting it's, thing. Who knows? But we must also think too that big bands didn't necessarily, necessarily stay with the swing era. Um, when I was living in the States, I had the great good fortune to hear the Stan Kenton Orchestra. It was a very progressive band. Yeah. Mel Lewis, big band. Uh, and then I would time travel backwards. I went to a rotary club at Oakland one night and the whole Les Brown band, remember Les Brown? Sentimental Journey, Doris Day? The Les Brown band is playing. In my shy way, I went up to introduce myself to Les Brown and we shook hands. I said, good evening, Mr. Brown, I'm from Australia. He said, fair dinkum. <laughs> <laughs> this yank had picked up our vernacular. Okay, we're going to move now to Lynette Irwin. And uh, Lynette and I go back a good 20, 25 years now. <coughs> Early 90s, late 80s, probably yeah, late 80s. Yeah, we were both yeah. kids. <laughs> and um, you've had, um, oh, by the way, just to wrap up on the swing era and, and what the Americans in Brisbane, last year we saw a wonderful musical drama called Boundary Street mm. at um, the Powerhouse Theatre. And James Morrison had a quintet recreating swing bands and it was also a recreation of a club that was developed in Brisbane in 1943-44 called the Carver Club, uh, mainly by black Americans. You've got to remember black American soldiers were segregated on the south side of Brisbane. White Americans could move freely on the other side. It wasn't respectable for res um, genteel Brisbane girls to be seen talking to black American soldiers. Sometimes they'd sneak over to the Carver Club and one of them falls in love with a black American guy. And we had authentic black Americans doing the dances and Morrison's playing. It, it took you right back to what it must have been like. And uh, so that was only last year and the tradition is still with us. Whoops. Uh, Lynette. Yes. Um, tell us... You've had a very interesting backdrop to this because you were playing violin, initially classical violin, but I suspect you probably jammed on that violin mm, to, eventually, to yeah. certain contemporary <laughs> artists. Mm. How did you get interested in jazz? Um, I was very fortunate that I had a wonderful mother who used to take me to a lot of concerts. And when I was 11, she took me to a Stefan Grappelli concert in Sydney. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. And then I heard a Daley Wilson big band concert with Kerry Bedell not long after. And I think I was pretty hooked by then. Yeah, it was like, whatever that is, I want to do that. <coughs> I want to play that. Mm. It's interesting you mentioned the Daley Wilson big band. That was such a popular big band back here in the 80s and a very progressive band led by drummer Warren Daly and trombonist Ed Wilson. Ed Wilson, yeah. Uh, but they didn't do In the Mood or Chattanooga Choo Choo. They did progressive, yeah, bloody yeah. rich type. Yes. Stan Kenton sometimes. Yeah, great bands. Adventurous pieces. Mm. And um, you, you also had some training in jazz, didn't you? Yes, I, st I studied um, improvisation with uh, Roger Frampton, and who was a piano player from originally from Great Britain, and he moved to Sydney, and was teaching at the Sydney Conservatorium, and also a trumpet player. Uh, his name was uh, Keith Sterling. I remember that. Yeah. Mm. Yes. So I learnt improvisation from <coughs> both those gentlemen in the mid to late 70s. Yes. Mm. Yeah. 
When you came to Brisbane, mm. um, just tell us again, what was roughly the date when you arrived here? I arrived here in 1986 mm-hmm. after living in Amsterdam for quite a number of years oh, with my ex-partner <laughs> who was a saxophonist and yes. composer and teacher. Mm. What did you see then? Did you see signs of a variety or were, were there things that you wanted to hear but couldn't hear? Uh, besides the music, I was so scared. I thought, oh, my God, we're coming... Joe B. Hockey Peterson was here and I was a bit, <laughs> scary, I was a bit really, scared, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, the first jazz concert I went to was at the Brisbane Jazz Club, actually, mm. and it was with Claire Hansen. Mm. Claire mm-hmm. Hansen was playing. Um, from Coming from um, Europe to um, Brisbane and, and having been brought up in Australia where there was probably quite a lot of contemporary jazz even in Australia, I mean, in Sydney before I left, there was the Keys Music Association down there. So I was sort of, it was a bit of a um, step back in time, I suppose, that there wasn't uh, a great pool of contemporary players here, though they, they, they were here because in 1983, before I got here, I believe Ted Vining was around and he had his music Eoy. So there were people that were... Um, working through that style of the music, mm. however, quite a lot of them left. You know, they'd go to Melbourne, mm. <laughs> which is what Ted did and Ian Chaplin and Tony Pay. Mm. Um, then there was the Quigley Moorhead big band, of course. I mean, there was, there was, there was David was... Bentley. There was people doing mm. different mm. stuff and also some original um, music, but there wasn't, there wasn't the venues, there wasn't the audience for it. There was also that thing of that, I suppose for me, it was more like entertainment than to actually sit down like in a concert setting yes. and hear the music. And um, I suppose for myself personally, I was very much of a, I like to listen to instrumental music. I wasn't so much a the singer fan. I think A singer fan of the singers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we still had people coming through and... People like Marlon Hayes was importing some wonderful artists. Exactly, Richie Cole. Uh, and uh, and oh, Sonny, I can still yeah. I can still see Sonny Stitt and Richie Cole mm. at Marlon's club in Adelaide Street, exchanging choruses on Just Friends, a very extended progressive yeah. piece, and the audience was packed. Yeah, you, know, you couldn't move, and I'm sure Rick was. <laughs> And uh, everybody would have been there, I reckon. And we had the basement, yeah. which had a distinct musical philosophy called bebop and beyond. Usually beyond, though, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, well, well it was sometimes beyond the audience's acceptance. Mm. But there was a mood for change. And uh, I recall one advocate for change in 1983 describing in Jazz Australian Contemporary Magazine Brisbane as a jazz wilderness. Mm. And then he goes on to say, most of the music, because too much of the music was foot-tapping, beer-drinking crap. Jazz Australian <laughs> Jazz Magazine, Volume 3, Issue 5, Page 12, 1983. Whoa. Who, that that? S- who wrote that? Yeah, who wrote Ted that? Bining was, <laughs> oh, Ted, oh, yes. was the author of the quote. He became our <laughs> jazz coordinator. I served, yeah, on, objectively. Yeah. I served on both his committee and yours. Yes. And uh, <laughs> it was a fairly volatile, volatile time when there was a push-pull dynamic in the, in the musical environment here. But that happens everywhere. When bebop uh, is invented, uh, or starts to be played around the late 30s and 1940s, people see this as degrading the music. It's not swing. Mm. It's, it, what is it? Uh, well, later, 25, 30 years later, when West Coast Cool is developing, someone says to Miles Davis, what do you think of West Coast Cool? And he says, it's white shit. This is a black American bebop trauma player describing proponents like Jerry Mulligan and Chet Baker, people I myself greatly admire, uh, as playing white S-H-I-T. Um, you, you get this shift in ideology and philosophy, whatever happens. Mm. And, um, but I think when I started to settle into the Brisbane jazz scene and having not long left the United States, 
I miss some of the adventurism of San Francisco, but I could see change was happening here. And it was good that there were guys like you around and guys like you advocating swing and you and perhaps I together sometimes would be going along and and hearing some of these mm. alternative starts. Yeah, there was some great music happening. I mean, there was the, the, the jazz and blues room at the Brisbane Travel Lodge had music on Tuesday to Saturday nights and... Yeah. There was quite an, an uh, I mean, it did change per night, that there was more of a meat market music, for want of a better word, on a Friday, Saturday night. However, there was a lot of jazz played there and a lot of jazz yeah. musicians, James Carter, Dewey Redman. Yeah. There was some amazing concerts. Yeah, that was a good, a good gig. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I, I guess we see the extension of that today when seeing as Toby Hancock comes to town, there'll be 1,900 people over there in the concert hall. But equally, they'll go to see Diana Crowell. Many of them will be at the Bublé concert, and we have yeah. an audience. Is this a sign that we're getting close to the end? Oh, uh, no. It looks like it. Have we got another five minutes? We yeah, we've got ten more, ten more minutes. Oh, that'll be good, because we have to put a coder on this. I've got a question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My question is probably to Lynette. Would you say that the introduction of jazz at a tertiary level here in Queensland was the result of, or actually assisted in, in widening the scene? Definitely assisted in widening yeah. the scene, without a doubt. And I think that's continued. Um, not only the uh, Queensland Cons Griffith University Queensland Conservatorium has a jazz department, there's also a private tertiary provider now in the Jazz Music Institute, um, which I think... So there's a lot of young people actually coming to jazz. You also have um, one of the, the uh, members of Trichotomy, which was originally called Misinterpretato, who is the head of the music department of, at JMC, which mm. is across the road here in Gray Street. And so he has not, you know, a number of those people in his course also interested in jazz. So there's quite a... From, I suppose fermentation, is that a word, mm. of, um, of musicians that it's sort of, I think it was the early 80s that it happened here in, mm. or the, the, in, in uh, certainly in Sydney it was the early 80s, or, no it was the 70s um, when the jazz course started there. And the Mike Knock I think was, came up for a while. Yes and he did, he was on the pianist, um, And still alive and still very well known and still creating original music so and also there's a lot of young people that have come and gone and come back mm. whereas a lot of a lot of them used to go and not come back yeah so the steve newcombs of the world the Raphael carlins of the world sean foran as well all studied overseas they've come back to brisbane and and bought their knowledge here and they're staying and mm. they have composed and they put on concerts and um you know have Right for 10-piece ensembles like the Western Composers Collective. It's so were tertiary courses started? How did they come about? How did jazz arrive at a tertiary institution in Queensland? I wasn't here in 1983. I only came here in about 86. But I'd say it would have been the early 80s that it started happening. Yeah, Am I think I that's right. There were precedents uh, in Sydney and Melbourne, mm. in Canberra. Um, we had a growing population. There seemed to be a demand. At that time, the conservatorium was located on the other side of town. Margaret Street. Margaret Street. And now it has its own campus right here. And uh, the jazz program is continuing. And those students are trained not just in the technical aspects of reading music, but in improvisatory elements. Mm. We have free concerts there at lunchtime. They'll be starting again very soon, and you can go and hear the QT, the uh, the Con Big Band, led by American trumpeter John Hoffman. It's well, it's it's tops. Mm. Half of those guys mm. will be playing with buble, and they can read charts so well. They say they can read fly sheet. I think it's mm. called, isn't it? You yeah, know, they they can read anything. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's a great, wonderful thing about jazz musicians on the whole. It, it, currently, I suppose, since the um, in tertiary education took on a jazz department, is that you have really highly skilled musicians. So they can play for anybody 
and play anything. Mm. Usually they play classical music as well, quite a lot of them, yeah. and they can read it. And, you know, people like Mike Nock and Keith Jarrett will play bark, you know? They, they practice bark. Yes. You know? If, we'll if, we, if we can uh, kind of just, just sort of uh, summarise where we are now, um, and perhaps we should do this for everybody because time is going to beat us, um, we'll, but we'll, since we'll continue with you. Where do you see Brisbane Jazz now? What are the changes? You've been here almost 30 years, mm -hmm. maybe more. Um, where are we today? Where is jazz in Brisbane today? I think it's quite healthy. I mean, there's always the not enough venues, not enough money. Uh, however, there are definitely more venues and there are more people supporting the live performance of, of contemporary Australian jazz music, mm. you know, i.e. Australian composers, Brisbane composers. So you've got The Box in West End, which does a Sunday night turbine jazz series once a month. Um, JMI has a turnaround jazz club. So mm. you have, and also when I came here, there was, I didn't hear contemporary jazz at the Brisbane Jazz Club. Now you, you will. Now it's definitely and a part a of their programming. And quite a number of those players, particularly the young ones, are from the conservatorium. Absolutely. And they welcome the opportunity to get out and test their skills before a real audience. Mm. It's very healthy. Yeah. I think it's great. I think there's an, an enormous amount of young people. I mean, if you go down to West End and, I mean, it's... The, yeah, I, can, I can be sitting with my mother in a beer garden and there's some kid who's playing, got an acoustic guitar and they're playing some jazz tunes and singing some jazz, you know, and they've got a singer with them and, and the, the, these, these two young people I'm thinking of are from JMI, but it, I could... They could be from the con. You know, there's mm. people everywhere that, that young people seem to be getting into it. And I think the access to the internet and being able to uh, go back in time and hear the John Coltrane's and hear the Benny Goodman's and, you know, it's all there for them. Mm. It's, they're like little sponges and they're taking it all in and, and they're continuing to... They're our future. Mm. Mm. Barry, yeah. um, we've come a long way since the swing era. But big bands are still with us. Yep. We have that swing night coming up next month. Well, there's a big band down below when we came in. For the yeah. Yes. Playing yeah. difficult charts. And then they also play Skylark as well. So they've got the balance just about right. Mm. Playing distinguished popular material as well as originals. Yes. Just thinking as uh, Liam was talking about, um, I think today's generation is the most academically gifted uh, because of the education. Yet my generation, Tony's generation, you'd learn it on the job, wouldn't you? That's right, mm. yes. So I think the difference then, you learn it on the job, there were plenty of jobs around. With the kids studying and playing and developing their art, my only concern is they should have a place where they can play it, you know? And uh, I, there's never going to be enough gigs to play, no. is there? But certainly we <laughs> have know. a new generation of jazz musicians who are you know, a very, very talented and accomplished generation. And as long as they can play jazz and... Uh, you know, we're going to be the, the better for it. Um, but, you know, there are at least two or three big bands in town now. And my own university, QUT, mm -hmm. has its own big band. Yeah. 18 piece. I think, I think that, yeah. and that, that's a great credit to the education department in Queensland. Because mm. I think that, that, that we have all these stage bands within schools. Mm. And it's been a long history of that. Probably came out of the British brass band thing. In, in, in the whole of the country, but um, I think there's something like 40,000 uh, children learn music in, in high schools, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I think nearly every state high school has a big band. Mm. Or, yeah, or, yeah. So the seeds are still there, and uh, we'll see where it all goes. Tony, your summation of where you see jazz today would be appreciated. Just a couple of points you mentioned about the school bands. I think the late John Morris had a lot to do with that because he ran a music shop mm -hmm. and provide, I think got onto the department to start music courses. Ah. And of course he sold them instruments, good business. Yep. But more importantly, once a year he would arrange for a competition. 
That's of all right. the bands in Queensland, and these tailed out at Shambler. Mm-hmm. And I think um, Hoffman may have been one of the adjudicators. They got people in, mm-hmm. and I knew bands that came down from Mackay. And mm. there was so much enthusiasm, so I think it goes back to there. Yeah. The other thing is, I think you mentioned about the money and paying for gigs. Well, as a matter of historical reference, when we started off at the Brisbane Jazz Club, um, we all had proper jobs, and the Pacific Jazz Men played down there two nights a week for nothing, mm. because we wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. We were looking for a place to play. Whether people came through the door, whether we were raided or whatever, didn't matter and we kept that going for two years now I can go down there and do a gig and okay I'll get paid and I'm more than happy to take that so it concerns me that people may start off playing thinking how much are they going to make Mm. if that's your attitude give it it. away become a car salesman (laughs) Mm -hmm. you play because you want to we did for two years the big band that I spoke about they used to take the door which was worked out at about three dollars fifty each, because those all the musicians in that band were professional, and at that time they did there was no chance of them being able to play that music in Brisbane, and that goes back to 1974. But, but the, the final part of the question is, what what what, what <coughs> musical changes are you seeing? Greater diversity? Oh yes, um, just, look, I, I look in the program for the Brisbane Jazz Club now, and I don't know any of the bands. Mm. Now that's my problem, not theirs. Yes, yes. Uh, and the different styles, and I had to go through the lineups to think. Okay, well that's probably a bit of fungal. There's a couple of horns in that band, so this, that, and the other. No, and that's good. It just shows mm. you how much gra- uh, jazz has grown and is growing all the time. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we will need to draw our dialogue to a close, but we have room for two short questions. We'll take anything. <laughs> With the democratisation of the recording business, uh, where people can produce their own CDs, is there in your uh, conservatory of music courses a business promotion strand where you can learn how to promote yourself professionally and uh, promote the art form professionally? Never. Well, be uh, I've actually run a workshop for con jazz students called Be Your Own Press Agent. And uh, I've alerted them to that because I, I used to do quite a lot of media work myself. But I think um, more attention could be paid at the conservatorium to that. And you've just reminded me that uh, it's something I can raise with our head of jazz studies because I think that's critically important. How do you get your face noticed in the crowd? Yeah, Neville. You sell them on the gig. I've, I've produced two commercial CDs over the years uh, with varying degrees of uh, success. And what you do is, you, if you're out there in front of the public, no matter what, you promote them. And that I sell, well, I've sold them all now, but I've got through quite a few over the years. You sell them on the gig. Mm. Yeah. 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 That's, a, that's a good that way. But you need that level of confidence that you're going to pull a crowd to the gig. And how do you do that? Is there, you're a long-standing musician. Young up-and-coming players don't always have that confidence, and yeah. I think this is a, where people like you come in. A lot of a lot of, of music, of course, is the young ones buy it on iTunes these days. They don't buy the actual physical product. I myself like the physical product. I liked that tangible mm. thing. But also, um, I mean, to have a, a CD reviewed is very important, which is hard. But um, there's a website called jazzqueensland.com. And um, there are people that would review Hmm. a CD and get it out there. In in fact, it's the very diversity of the music today that's the biggest challenge. It's probably getting harder to be noticed. Yeah, well, the the guy that's been writing CDs for The Australian for a long time, John Macbeth, like um, I sent him a CD of uh, Mariali Pacheco, originally from Cuba, and um, had a, a, a jazz trio here. And he said, oh, my, I hope I can review it. I've got hundreds of mm. CDs mm. sitting on my mm. you yes. know, desk and waiting still, to be reviewed. As a former reviewer, I get one a fortnight from somebody. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have time for one more quick question, I ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, I don't think we do, Neville. All right. Uh, there's, it's a very quick one, I'm sure. Oh, come on. We can so always... We both have to be elsewhere, but... Um... Okay. Well, All right, maybe one more question, but can I, can I just say right now, 
upstairs on level four is a, a white glove session, which I'm running. You can come upstairs. We'll be there. Put on white gloves and handle material from the collection, which is all about Queensland jazz. Very good. Just mightn't have an opportunity to see otherwise. So. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Cheryl, and just talking about CDs, and Tony can vouch for this. Wherever I go, if there's anybody playing and they've got a CD with them, I buy it. Thank you. Even That's if good. it's only $5. And a lot of young people have $5 CDs. Yes. And I was in Melbourne last month, and I came back with three CDs from one of the band and gave them away to other people. Fantastic. Well done. That's very good. Thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We had 27 people here. Four or five had to leave, but we're pleased that you could stay to the end and we'll hope there'll be an opportunity for more dialogue with you somewhere. You have my email mm. contact. If you want to find out about our free jazz concerts at the Conservatorium, drop me a nine or ring me. You also have my mobile. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.